Okay. Good morning, Martin. Thank you for joining, speaking about poetry. Um, and, uh, you know, there is so much to say and, and, and not much time. So, uh, but let me ask a very broad, just break the ice question, you know, which might seem a little simple or complex. Uh, what is poetry for you? Well, that's both very simple and very complex. <laughs> I'm not even sure I can answer that question. To yeah. me, it's like asking what is music? Right. What, is, what is dance? What is theater? What is art? I think we sometimes have a tendency to talk or think about poetry with a capital P. And um, as Robert Creeley once put it, uh, thankfully, a plurality of poetries exist. Um, I, I can't speak for all poets. I can't speak for all poetry. I can certainly speak for mine um, and I can speak for uh, uh, others, some others. But um, it's, uh, I think, um, beyond the scope of my modest capabilities to tell you what poetry is. Tell me, okay, well, let's, let's, let's get right to uh, what poetry is in your, in your latest book, Floaters, you know. Um, and, and as I read Floaters and reread Floaters, I, I'm struck by, by the names of people you honor and you, and you celebrate, or whose stories you tell in this book. And um, I think it's, it's a very moving book, a powerful book. And there are uh, poems in this book that will stay with the language. And, 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 I, and I'd like this conversation to sort of focus on why. And, 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 and naming to me is, is, is an important element in this book. Naming of heroes, naming of events, whether uh, tragic or, or, or celebratory. Um, and why not let's begin with two names. Uh, in the poem Floaters that uh, it's written about Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. Can you tell us about them and, and what led to the poem Floaters? And then I'll ask you to read the poem. Okay. Um, Oscar and Valeria, as they came to be known, were two Salvadoran migrants, father and daughter, who drowned crossing the Rio Grande in June of 2019. Um, a photograph of their bodies taken by Mexican journalist Julia Le Duc uh, went viral. It appeared everywhere. This photograph provoked uh, outreach. It provoked grief. It also provoked trutherism. Uh, there was a post, anonymous post, in the I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group, uh, charging that the photograph was faked. And so I responded in the poem to two parallel events. One was the drowning and the photograph itself, but also to this trutherism, the, the outrageous charge that all this was, was tricked up. So obviously many poems begin as arguments. You might say this poem began as an argument too, but as you also point out, it began as uh, as an attempt to reclaim the humanity of the dehumanized. And that's why the power of naming is so central to the poem. Um, the word floaters, which gives the poem its title, um, comes from a term used by certain members of the Border Patrol to describe those who have drowned crossing over. Um, so, I'll read the poem now as, as you ask, uh, floaters, epigraph. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and ask, 
Have you all ever seen floaters this clean? I'm not trying to be an ass, but I have never seen floaters like this. Could this be another edited photo? We've all seen the Dems and liberal parties do some pretty sick things. Anonymous post, I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group. Like a beer bottle thrown into the river by a boy too drunk to cry, like the shard of a styrofoam cup drained of coffee, brown is the river, like the plank of a fishing boat broken in half by the river, the dead float. And the dead have a name. Floaters, say the men of the border patrol, keeping watch all night by the river, hearts pumping coffee as they say the word floaters, soft as a bubble, hard as a shoe as it nudges the body to see if it breathes, to see if it moans, to see if it sits up and speaks. And the dead have names. A feast day parade of names. Names that dress all in red. Names that twirl skirts. Names that blow whistles. Names that shake rattles. Names that sing in praise of the saints. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. See how they rise off the tongue. The calling of bird to bird somewhere in the trees above our heads, trilling in the dark heart of the leaves. Say what we know of them now they are dead. Oscar slapped dough for pizza with oven, blistered fingers, daughter Valeria sang, banging a toy guitar. He slipped free of the apron he wore in the blast of the oven, sold the motorcycle he would kick till it sputtered to life, counted up vessels for the journey across the river, and the last of his 25 years, and the last of her 23 months. There is another name that beats its wings in the heart of the trees. Say, Tanya, Vanessa, Avalos, Oscar's wife and Valeria's mother, the witness stumbling along the river. Now, their names rise off her tongue. Say, Oscar y Valeria. He swam from Matamoros across to Bronzeville. The girl slung around his neck, stood her in the weeds on the Texas side of the river, swore to return with her mother in hand, turning his back as fathers do, who later say, I turned around and she was gone. In the time it takes for a bird to hop from branch to branch, Valeria jumped in the river after her father. Maybe he called out her name as he swept her up from the river. Maybe the river drowned out his voice as the water swept them away. Tanya called out the names of the saints, but the saints drowsed in the stupor of birds in the dark, their cages covered with blankets. The men on patrol would never hear their pleas for asylum, watching for floaters, hearts pumping coffee all night on the Texas side of the river. No one, they say, had ever seen floaters this clean. Oscar's black shirt yanked up to the armpits, Valeria's arm slung around her father's neck. Even after the light left her eyes, both face down in the weeds back on the Mexican side of the river. Another edited photo. See how her head disappears in his shirt, the waterlogged diaper bunched in her pants, the blue of the blue cans. The radio warned us about the crisis actors we see at one school shooting after another. The man called Oscar will breathe, sit up, speak, tug the black shirt over his head, shower off the mud and shake hands with the photographer. Yet, the floaters did not float down the Rio Grande like Olympians showing off the backstroke, nor did their souls float up to Dallas, land their rumored jobs and a president shot in the head as he waved from his motorcade. No bubbles rose from their breath in the mud, light as the iridescent circles of soap that would fascinate a two-year-old. And the dead still have names. 
names that sing in praise of the saints, names of flower and blossoms of white, a cortege of names dressed all in black trailing the coffins to the cemetery. Carve their names in headlines and gravestones they would never know in the kitchens of this cacophonous world. Enter their names in the book of names. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. Bury them in a corner of the cemetery named for the sainted archbishop of the poor, shot in the heart saying mass, bullets bought by the taxes I paid when I worked as a bouncer and fractured my hand 40 years ago and bumper stickers read, El Salvador is Spanish for Vietnam. When the last bubble of breath escapes the body, may the men who speak of floaters, who have never seen floaters this clean, float through the clouds to the heavens, where they paddle the air as they wait for the saint who flips through the keys in his ring like a drowsy janitor, till he fingers the key that turns the lock and shuts the gate on their babble-tongued faces, and they plunge back to earth, a shower of hailstones pelting the river, the Mexican side of the river. Oh, this poem is just, it's, it's just, an amazing poem, you know, and it has so, it, it, and it works, it goes back into history too, right? I mean, it goes back to Dallas, the president killed you. Uh, it, it goes, um, it, uh, it goes forward into, into some kind of divine judgment, you know, and the, at the end of this, of these people who, who will, um, who will laugh about these these and come up with this term floaters and yet um, tell me tell me about um, I mean how the poem is written on the page I mean these are these long lines there they 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 tell they're long lines of a story and yet every image is is carved almost in stone you know uh, and yet so tell me about the technique um, this is a technique you've grown up you've grown towards the long line throughout your work from early on to uh, is this the sort of the culmination of that the triumph of that of that development uh, where you combine both story and and lyricism and uh, and you found the, the the vehicle for it which is this long line which of course you know we find in American poetry before in Whitman and and in Ginsburg and so on so tell, tell me about the, the technical development that this poem manifests in your own work and, uh, and, and then the, um, the way it sort of grapples with history and retells history for today's reader. Go ahead. Well, uh, to address the technique first, um, there, there are two fundamental elements. One would be the image. Uh, the, this poem, all my poems, would be grounded in the image, the senses on paper. Um, I couldn't uh, relay this narrative without the image. Uh, the image is the building block of this poem. Um, the image is to the poem with the boxcars to the train. There's one after another, after another, after another. So that's the first element. The second is musicality. The second, you can hear uh, the, the rhythms in the poem. Of course, it's not following any strict meter, but there's definitely a beat. And uh, there's, there, are, there are lines in the poem that are almost iambic. Uh, you can hear that when I read it out loud. Um, and sometimes I find myself with my right hand almost conducting the orchestra of the poem. Um, of course, for me, it's a Latin jazz orchestra. Now, uh, the long lines indeed uh, relate back to both element number one and element number two. I can put more images into a single line and I can put more beats into a single line. That creates a sense of momentum, a sense of rushing forward and of course, this is form, and I'm looking for form to serve the content. 
it serves the content here. You could see the river in the poem, for example. You could see the uh, hurtling of inevitable tragedy in the poem. You could see the, uh, the power of the bigotry also uh, in its momentum, in its rushing forward to contain the, uh, the so-called invasion of people like this. And uh, naturally, when I read the poem uh, today, it, there is still relevance. The meaning of the poem perhaps has changed since I wrote it, but it is still relevant. That happens with many of my poems. And uh, as we know, uh, we're, we're constantly hearing about the border. Uh, we're constantly hearing about um, the, the, the power struggle that's going on. And this is a, a reminder uh, that we are ultimately talking about real suffering human beings. Right. In, in, in 2021, in, in the United States and Mexico, in that border, there's a, a, a tragedy that's been repeated and repeated. And, float, uh, and, and, and talking about that, just very quickly, just the other day, I read about a border patrol agent saving somebody's, you know, giving, uh, uh, getting somebody who had been managed to get onto the island in between Matamoros and, and Brownsville and, and bringing that person back by uh, giving, uh, you know, res reviving the body. Um, but I wonder how that, uh, and I think about the lives of the Border Patrol agents. Now they are, they are the sort of the negative impulse in this poem, right? The, one, the, the ones who are, you know, contributing to that anonymous Facebook page that, so how does one deal with that that they, they too are human beings working this un, very complicated, difficult uh, business of, of, of trying to manage immigration on the border by desperate visitors who have no, who are trying to find, you know, um, uh, an escape route to their from their own sufferings and tragedies back, back home. I mean, this is a, a question that goes beyond the poem, but it, it, the poem also makes me think about that, that question, the, the day-to-day tribulations and struggles of, the, of that relationship between immigrant or would-be immigrant and, and the uh, people who are guarding the border, so to speak. I, I don't know if you want to reflect on that or... Well, I'm not sure how much I have to say about it. This is uh, a poem about migrants. Right. It's not a poem about the border patrol. And in fact, I, I think I'm very clear introducing the poem and in the body of the poem. Uh, this is not about every single border patrol agent. The epigraph comes from a very specific source, the I'm 1015 border patrol Facebook group. Right. And uh, this was a group exposed by um, uh, an, a journal called ProPublica. And, you know, if you want to Google I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group, read about them in ProPublica. And, and you'll see that there is this culture that exists within the Border Patrol. And there's no denying it. Right. So while I'm, I'm sure there are heroic Border Patrol agents, just as there are heroic uh, uh, government uh, public servants, shall we say, everywhere. Uh, you know, the question is, where do they fall in history? You can be a good and decent person. Right. You can do good and decent things and still be on the wrong side of history. I yeah. firmly believe that. And this is, this is, I reiterate, this is about the migrants. This is about the people who, two people who drowned crossing over. And there was recently, very recently, another drowning in the same river. And it was a Guatemalan child. 
So it's still happening. That drowning did not produce headlines. It did not produce uh, a photograph that went viral. It did not produce outrage or grief or even trutherism. It was briefly mentioned and then we passed on to the next tragedy. And, you know, for me, the ultimate responsibility for this does not lie with the border patrol. It, it, it is never about the people on the front lines. At the end of the day, the responsibility is with the White House and it lies with us. And the question I have is, what's it gonna take? What's it gonna take as we see image after image after image of human suffering and your story after story of human suffering, for us to react to these human beings crossing the border as human beings ourselves. This is one of those situations that holds a mirror up to us as a society. And the question is, what do we see in that mirror? And if that mirror is empty, then we are nothing but vampires. You know, AOC, was asked the other day about this very same uh, quote crisis. And she said, you know what this is? This is a crisis, all right. It's an imperialism crisis and it's a carceral crisis. And what did she mean by that? The imperialism crisis. She's referring to the history of US intervention in Central America, right, right. whether it's military, political or economic whether it's occupation by the Marines or the propping up of some dictatorship or the support of some brutal repression. It's the wars that Ronald Reagan fostered in El Salvador and Guatemala for both of his administrations. I make reference in the poem to that bumper sticker, El Salvador is Spanish for Vietnam. Vietnam, right, right. Because that's the way we saw it in those days, proxy armies going into Central America, and we were wondering if it was going to blossom into another Vietnam, right? So that's an imperialism crisis. Who created this crisis? We did, because we want bananas bought cheaply, because we want coffee bought cheaply. That means the exploitation of both cheap labor and cheap natural resources, bottom line. Now, she also referred to a carceral crisis. In other words, right now, our immigration system is virtually indistinguishable from the system of incarceration in this country, right? We are violating human rights left and right. Right, right. Okay, what happened to the right of asylum in this country with the Statue of Liberty proudly posing in New York Harbor? It, it, it virtually does not exist. So, you know, we have to step back. We have to look at the big picture. We have to ask who is ultimately responsible. And that means looking in the mirror. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad I read, raised the issue of the border because you, your eloquent response is very, very helpful to, for all of us to hear. And, it, and it's, thank you. Thank you. Over to the soccer ball sailing over a barbed wire fence. I mean, this is just another one of the, the many uh, strong, uh, poems in this book and and just the title, you know, a barbed wire fence and a soccer ball. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Uh, this is again relating to migration and, and, and incarceration and, and, and um, this theme of uh, uh, looking in the mirror. What is the mirror showing us? You know, if we, go ahead, I, I'll let you respond. Hmm. Well, uh, under uh, the Trump regime, um, they were putting kids in cages when they crossed the border. And so this resulted in uh, the establishment of a very large internment camp for migrant adolescents at uh, Tornillo, Texas. Um, another one eventually opened in uh, Homewood, Florida. But the focus of this poem is on Tornillo. And uh, at first, no one noticed. And then there was um, protest. The protest essentially began with one man, 
His name is Josh Rubin. And Josh Rubin began a lonely vigil outside of Bonillo, holding signs, talking to people as they went in and out. And soon he was joined by others. And then eventually this caught the attention of the media locally, from locally to nationally. And then came the congressional delegation and all hell broke loose because this indeed meant kids in cages. Thousands locked up at Tornillo. Um, and they had found their own way to protest. Josh Rubin and his friends were protesting outside the barbed wire. Right. The kids inside found their own way to protest. Um, they were finally, after much deliberation, allowed to play soccer. And they were playing soccer and occasionally they would kick the balls over the barbed wire fence that surrounded them. They would kick the balls over the fence to a place where they could not go very deliberately. In fact, some of these kids even started writing their names and their numbers on the soccer balls that were kicked over the fence. This caught the attention of the protesters on the other side. And so we began to see photographs, we began to see Facebook posts of these soccer balls. And what did it all mean? Uh, my friend, Camino Perez Bustillo, who's a human rights lawyer and was connected uh, to this movement to end the internment camps at Conillo and elsewhere, uh, who was at the time working for the Hope Border Institute in El Paso, gained access to Tornillo and did a series of interviews with these adolescent migrants. And they told him what was really going on in there. Um, and this is when he found out what their intentions were when they kicked those soccer balls over the barbed wire fence. And they made it very clear to him what they were doing, that it was a protest, that the soccer balls were going where they could not that it, it, there was, uh, uh, it became a metaphor. Sometimes people act out metaphors and these kids were doing exactly that. So uh, I think it's interesting that Camilo, even in the midst of the Trump administration was able to gain such access and do these interviews and bring out the truth of what was really happening. Um, so with all this pressure, the camp at Tornillo was shut down. The protest worked and it does work. Now, I want to point out the same people are still out there. They belong to a group called Witness at the Border. And if you want to know what's going on, check out their web website, witnessattheborder.org. There are posts every day about what's happening with migrants in this country. It's a valuable resource. And would you say your poem contributed to the closing or will contribute to future closings of such such jails? I mean, poetry makes something happen. I mean, is it make, are you making something happen writing these stories, these poems? It's part of a puzzle. I think the, the puzzle is what matters. Uh, this is a piece in the puzzle, but every piece is an important piece. Um, some people argue when they hear a poem like this, that it is basically preaching to the choir. Well, right now the choir needs the preaching. The choir needs this form of encouragement. Uh, the choir needs a song to sing. And so even if that's all it does, I'm gratified by that. Um, I wrote this poem, in fact, for an event uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, where we gathered in a, in a church to protest what was happening with these uh, kids in cages and these internment camps on the border. So that, that was the origin of the poem. I, I, that, that and my conversations with Camilo. It would be good to hear the poem, given that we've just spent a few minutes and you're talking about it. And Tornillo is, a, I mean, well, you explain it in the poem. So go ahead, if you don't mind reading our uh, ode to the soccer ball sailing over a barbed wire fence. Sure. Thank you. Ode to the soccer ball sailing over a barbed wire fence. Epigraph. Tornillo 
has become the symbol of what may be the largest U.S. mass detention of children not charged with crimes since the World War II internment of Japanese Americans. Robert Moore, Texas Monthly. Praise Tornillo, word for screw in Spanish, word for jailer in English, word for 3,000 adolescent migrants incarcerated in camp. Praise the 3,000 soccer balls gift wrapped at Christmas as if raindrops in the desert inflated and bounced through the door. Praise the soccer games rotating with a whistle every 20 minutes so 3,000 adolescent migrants could take turns kicking a ball. Praise the boys and girls who walked a thousand miles, blood caked in their toes, yelling in Spanish in a dozen Mayan tongues on the field. Praise the first teenager bringing a blaze like chili pepper Christmas lights to kick a soccer ball high over the chain link and barbed wire fence. Praise the first teenager to scrawl a name and number on the face of the ball, then boot it all the way to the dirt road on the other side. Praise the smirk of teenagers at the jailers scooping up fugitive soccer balls, jabbering about the ingratitude of teenagers at Christmas. Praise the soccer balls sailing over the barbed wire fence, white and black like the moon, yellow like the sun, blue like the world. Praise the soccer ball flying to the moon, flying to the sun, flying to other worlds, flying to Antigua, Guatemala, where Starbucks buys coffee beans. Praise the soccer ball bounding off the lawn at the White House, thudding off the president's head as he waves to absolutely no one. Praise the piñata of the president's head, jelly beans pouring from his ears, enough to feed 3,000 adolescents incarcerated at Tornillo. Praise Tornillo. Word in Spanish for adolescent migrant internment camp, abandoned by jailers in the desert, liberated by a blizzard of soccer balls. I, 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 I'm, I'm in, and then, and then you follow that poem in the book with "Not for Him the Fiery Lake of the False Prophet," which we had the pleasure of publishing in the Beltway Poetry Quarterly, and. And it's about that president that has gone. Uh, how does a poem like that sit now? Are, are we? Is it a, a warning not to not to bring that kind of person back? Is it is it helpful? Uh, is it a topical poem, or is it a poem? I mean, or does one worry about these things when you write a poem like this? When you're writing, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well. Few, a few answers to that question. First of all, the book itself is uh, a document of the Trump regime. All the poems were written during the presidency of Donald Trump. So it is inevitably a product and a document uh, of the Trump regime. Secondly, Although Trump is gone, Trumpism is not. Uh, that election was hardly a landslide. It, it, there was no robbery, obviously. It was legitimate, but neither was it a landslide that the Democrats expected. And of course, the Democrats were particularly disappointed by the outcome in Congress. So just if in terms of measuring the votes, this man got 70 million votes. And that, of course, does not account for all the people who didn't bother to get to the voting booth or mail in their ballot. Trumpism is very much with us. The culture of Trump is very much present. It's not just present in the Republican Party, but it's present out there as well. Now there's finally and belatedly a reckoning with anti-Asian violence. I would argue that's also a product of Trumpism over the last several years, going back to the year of the campaign. Um, so yes, Trump 
is a is the central figure in in several of these poems but i don't think it means that the poems are now artifacts or merely topical uh they are uh if anything will will document a time that future generations might well find inexplicable is it a warning yes of course it is um you know, I think of Wilfred Owen who said, uh, you know, basically all a poet can do today is warn in, in the preface to his posthumous collection of poems. Uh, but it's, it's also relevant in the sense that we are, this is, we are still in la lucha, as they say in Spanish, right. in the struggle. This is far, far from over. I think let's, let me ask you to, if you have the energy to read, not for him, the fear of the false prophet. And then let's turn to a more intimate, personal side of the book. A couple of poems where, well, I, I we'll go there and also, um, and finish the conversation in that direction. How's that? Go, go ahead. Okay. Got to find it. Okay. Not for him, the fiery lake of the fall. I mean, I think just to just to finish this portion of the Trump era and the the, the, the yes, it is it the book is very much about this era, but but there are poems in it that sort of work outside of that uh, yes. definition. And I'd like to just talk about those as well and then of course. Uh, well, ahead. this particular poem uh, comes out of a hate crime the first hate crime committed in the name of Donald Trump was not committed in the expected places. It was not committed in Alabama or Mississippi or Arkansas. Um, it was committed in Boston, Massachusetts. It was committed by two brothers uh, coming home from a Red Sox game, that most quintessential of activities in Boston. Right. Um, and they encountered a homeless Mexican immigrant sleeping outside um, a, uh, a subway station in Boston. And they uh, attacked him, as the poem relates. Um, so the poem is about that. But then the second half of the poem shifts into what I would call Donald Trump's idea of hell, empathy. Because at that moment, there were healing hands that place themselves upon this body. And at the end of the night, into the dawn, there were more healing hands than hurting hands placed upon this body. So that's, that's his idea of hell. And thus the poem, not for him, the fiery lake of the false prophet, epigraph. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Donald Trump, June 16th, 2015. They woke him up by pissing in his face. He opened his mouth to scream in Spanish, so his mouth became a urinal at the ballpark. Scott and Steve the leader brothers celebrating a night at Fenway where the Sox beat the Indians and a rookie named Rodriguez spun the seams on his change up to hypnotize the tribe. Later that night, Steve urinated on the door of his cell and Scott told the cops why they did it. Donald Trump was right. All these illegals need to be deported. He was a Mexican in a sleeping bag outside JFK station on a night in August. So they called him a wetback and emptied their bladders in his hair. In court, the lawyers spoke his name, Guillermo Rodriguez, immigrant with papers, crop picker in the fields, trader of bottles and cans collected in his cart. Two strangers squashed the cartilage in his nose like a can drained of beer. 
in dreams. He would remember the shoes digging into his rib cage, the pole raked repeatedly across his cheekbones and upraised knuckles, the high five over his body. Donald Trump was right, said Scott. And Trump said, the people that are following me are very passionate. His hands fluttered as he spoke. A demagogue's hands, no blood under the fingernails, no whiff of urine to scrub away. He would orchestrate the chant to build that wall at rally after rally, bellowing till the blood rushed to his face, red as a demagogue in the grip of masturbatory dreams. A tribute to the new conquistador, the wall raised up by Mexican hands, Mexican hair and fingernails bristling in the brick, Mexican blood swirling in the cement, like raspberry syrup on a vanilla sundae. On the Cinco de Mayo, he leered over a taco bowl at Trump Tower. Not for him, the fiery lake of the false prophet reddening his ruddy face. Not for him, the devils of Puritan imagination shrieking in a foreign tongue and climbing in the window like the immigrant demons he conjures for the crowd. Not even for him, 10,000 years of the leader brothers streaming a fountain of piss in his face as he sputters forever. For him, hell is a country where the man in a hard hat paving the road to JFK station sees Guillermo and dials 911. Hell is a country where EMTs kneel to wrap a blanket around the shivering shoulders of Guillermo and wipe his face clean. Hell is a country where the nurse at the emergency room hangs a morphine drip for Guillermo so he can go back to sleep. 2,000 miles away, someone leaves a trail of water bottles on the desert for the border crossing of the next Guillermo. We smuggle ourselves across the border of a demagogue's dream. <clears throat> Confederate generals on horseback tumble one by one into the fiery lake of false prophets. Into the fiery lake crumbles the demolished wall. Thousands stand, sledge hammers in hand to await the bullhorns and handcuffs, await the trembling revolvers. In the full moon of the flashlight, every face interrogates the interrogator. In the full moon of the flashlight, every face is the face of Guillermo. Marvelous. And you know, every face is the face of Guillermo. And going back to the earlier comments about the mirror and what we see when we look at the mirror, you know, and do we see ourselves or do we see the face of Guillermo? And do, um, you know, I, I just, uh, let's segue and finish with, some reflections on, on some of some other poems in the book that, that are very personal in a sense. I mean, poems about your father, poems to Jack Agueros, who was a kind of a model and a teacher mm -hmm. for you as a poet. Mm -hmm. and, and poems about my wife too. And your, and your wife, yes, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, Lauren. And um, which is also about naming, naming them and, and honoring them. Um, and it's also there written in a quieter tone, I suppose, a kind of a more gentle, elegiac tone. Mm -hmm. um, I, we happen to be recording this conversation on Good Friday, which, and, and you mentioned how your father was not a, um, a believer in a sense. I mean, he, he did not believe in any, and I, and I, I assume that you also are an, an atheist or an agnostic, I'm not sure, but you, if you could talk about Let's have we talk about letters to my father to begin, and then and then move on to a couple of the other poems to finish um, this reflection on on Flotus. Um, you mentioned in letter to my father that the ashes are in an urn next with a Puerto Rican flag around it, you know, on your on your mantelpiece. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting you mentioned that the Puerto Rican flag is there, and which brings up questions about the migration from Puerto Rico and, yes. and, and identity and nationalism. And so the political is, is personal as well. Anyway, if, let's talk about Letter to My Father and, and, and the other poems I mentioned, the ones to your wife and... and, and yeah. 
Well, uh, there are some very personal roots for each of these poems. When we talk about letter to my father and you uh, made reference to his ashes. In fact, uh, since I am so sacrilegious, they're, they're not even in an urn. They're, they're in the original box um, from uh, the mortuary. And my, uh, my request along with my mother when we uh, went to the mortuary and signed all the documents uh, was for a Puerto Rican flag to go with the, the box. You get, he was a veteran, let me clarify. He was a veteran, he was in the Air Force. And uh, when a, a veteran dies and, and is cremated as in this situation in Pacifica, California in 2014, they, they offer you an American flag. And, I, and my mother said, oh, no, 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 he wouldn't want that. <laughs> you know, uh, no, he, 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 he wants, he would have wanted a Puerto Rican flag. And, and the uh, woman in the war trade looked as if we had just asked for the flag planted on the moon by the astronauts. <laughs> so there was a small bit of justice involved in wrapping the box in the Puerto Rican flag. And, uh, you know, I, my father was an independentista like me, he believed in the independence of Puerto Rico. So that's a, you know, it was a way of, of, of honoring him, I suppose. But I, you know, it's just very simple. His, his ashes are in a box and the box is on the bookshelf and it's wrapped up in a Puerto Rican flag. And it's personal in another sense as well, this poem, because the poem focuses on his hometown uh, called Utuado in the mountains of Puerto Rico. That's where he was born in 1930. And uh, when Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico in the fall of 2017, all of a sudden, I saw Utuado everywhere. I saw Utuado over and over again um, on television screens, on my computer screen, um, in social media. Um, it was uh, the, the focus of uh, of articles and headlines and uh, John Lee Anderson in the New Yorker, a, a very good writer, wrote that Utuado had, uh, had become the epicenter of the hurricane. So with all this destruction of his beloved island and his beloved Utuado, I began talking to him and of course, talking to the ashes in the box, to his corporeal remains, the seven pounds of ashes. And from that very intimate exchange, talking to the dead, I produced a poem about what was happening because paradoxically, I was speaking to him as if he could hear me. But I was also, I was also speaking to him as if he did not know what was happening uh, back here on earth. And, and so that's where this poem came from. I, that, that's, you know, me talking to him about what was happening, not just in Utuado, but in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and, and ultimately I invoke him as a spirit. I want him to return and do battle with the, the, the forces of, of Hurricane Trump. That's right, because Trump appears in the poem as well. And, and, and you make him alive. Your yes. poem is a living, the living word, you know, in a sense. And, and so that's the great thing about being able to, to invoke and, and put in, in verse. Please read the poem and then we'll, we'll talk about, uh, I, I realize we'll have a few more minutes and then after that to talk about this and, and go to the poem about Agueros as well and, and your wife. Go ahead. Okay. Letter to my father, October, 2017. You once said, my reward for this life would be a thousand pounds of dirt shoveled in my face. You were wrong. You are seven pounds of ashes in a box, a Puerto Rican flag wrapped around you next to a red brick from the house in Utuado where you were born, all crammed together on my bookshelf. 
you taught me there is no God, no life after this life. So I know you are not watching me type this letter over my shoulder. When I was a boy, you were God. I watched from the seventh floor of the projects as you walked down into the street to stop a public execution. A big man caught a small man stealing his car, and everyone in Brooklyn heard the car alarm wail of the condemned. He's killing me. At a word from you, the executioner's hand slipped from the hair of the thief. The kid was high, was all you said when you came back to us. When I was a boy and you were God, we flew to Puerto Rico. You said, my grandfather was the mayor of Utualo. His name was Buenaventura. That means good fortune. I believed in your grandfather's name. I heard the tree frogs chanting to each other all night. I saw a banana leaf and elephant palms sprouting from the mountain's belly. I gnawed the mango's pit and the sweet yellow hair stuck between my teeth. I said to you, you came from another planet. How'd you do it? You said, every morning, just before I woke up, I saw the mountains. Every morning, I see the mountains. And Utualo, three sisters, all in their 70s, all bedridden, all Pentecostales who only left the house for church, lay sleeping on mattresses spread across the floor when the hurricane gutted the mountain the way a butcher slices open a dangled pig and a rolling wall of mud buried them, leaving the fourth sister to stagger into the street, screaming like an unheeded prophet about the end of the world. In Utualo, a man had cultivated a garden of aguacate and carambola, feeding the avocado and star fruit to his nieces from New York, so the trees in his garden beheaded all at once like the soldiers of a beaten army, and so hanged himself. In Utualo, a welder and a handyman rigged a pulley with a shopping cart to ferry rice and beans across the river where the bridge collapsed, witnessed the cart swaying above so many hands that raised the sign that told the helicopters, Campamento Los Olvidados, Camp of the Forgotten. Los Olvidados, wait, seven hours in line for a government meal of skittles and Vienna sausage or a tarp to cover the bones of a house with no roof as the fungus grows on their skin from sleeping on mattresses drenched with the spit of the hurricane. They drink the brown water waiting for microscopic monsters in their bellies to visit plagues upon them. A nurse says, these people are gonna have an epidemic. These people are gonna die. The president flips rolls of paper towels to a crowd at a church in Wainau, Zeus lobbing thunderbolts on the lot ward of his delusions. Down the block, Cousin Ricardo, Bernice's boy, says that somebody stole his can of diesel. I heard somebody ask you once what Puerto Rico needed to be free. And you said, Tres pulgadas de sangre en la calle. Three inches of blood in the street. Now, three inches of mud flow through the streets of Utualo, and troops patrol the town as if guarding the vein of copper in the ground, as if a shovel digging graves in the backyard might strike the ore below, as if La Brigada swinging machetes to clear the road might remember the last uprising. I know you are not God. I have the proof. Seven pounds of ashes in a box on my bookshelf. Gods do not die, and yet, I want you to be God again. Stride from the crowd to seize the president's arm before another roll of paper towels sails away. Thunder Spanish obscenities in his face. Banish him to a roofless rainstorm and utualo so he unravels one soaked sheet after another till there is nothing left but his cardboard heart. I promised myself I would stop talking to you white box of gray grit. You were deaf even before you died. Hear my promise now. I will take you to the mountains where houses lost like ships at sea rise 
blue and yellow from the mud. I will open my hands. I will scatter your ashes. Engutuavo. Magnificent boy. I, 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 suddenly I thought of uh, uh, Ginsburg talking to all Greybeard <laughs> in the supermarket. I mean, just this the address, you know, to the, and, but then you know, there's so much here and yet I, I let, the whole question of identity of national, because I mean, I am a Sri Lankan and a Tamil, you know, and the war of independence was lost in, in that country, you know, and then one thinks about, and so the Puerto Rican independence movement is something that I, uh, I think about as well. Um, and then I think, uh, and the relationship to one's father, my father was a poet, and, uh, Inevitably, one thinks about one's own fathers when you, your poem brings up for the reader so many associations from the uh, Just in another, in another poem you write, it's called Flan for Jack Aguero, so a poet who, who you honor and who poet who helped you along on the, on the road. And you know, as some of the listeners might be poets, writing, learning from this conversation. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you what you learned from Jack Aguero said, and the meaning of Flan the, in particular, because that story is also related, I think, to, to nationalism and identity and, and you know, finding a piece of your own earth wherever you are as a migrant, um, finding your own Flan, you know, even if you're in a Chinese restaurant uptown. Go ahead. Can... Jack Agueros was a poet, a fiction writer, an essayist, a translator, a uh, community activist, and the director of El Museo del Barrio in East Harlem at the time, the only Puerto Rican museum in the mainland United States. He was also uh, a good friend of my father's, and he became my second father. Uh, Jack was, uh, as the poem relates, uh, an amazing human being. Uh, when you ask about what I learned from him as a poet, I would say, I learned that it is possible. I learned that it was possible to be a poet because I could see another human being engaged in the act of poetry, not scribbling in a journal, not doing this every once in a while. He was a flesh and blood poet. And what we need to learn first as young poets is that it is possible. And so he, he did that for me. And of course, I was developing along my own lines. I had other influences as well. But when we talk about Jack, that's really where it begins because he was the first poet I ever met. Um, I was, uh, whenever I came to New York, a guest in his apartment in the Chelsea section of Manhattan. And uh, I began to go through his poems sitting in manuscript on his table in the living room. I would sit there and read them. Uh, those poems eventually, by the way, became uh, his first published collection called Correspondence Between the Stonehallers, published by Hanging Loose Press. I know they also publish you. And they published all of Jack's poetry collections, uh, Sonnets from the Puerto Rican, Lord, Is This a Psalm? And uh, they're still out there. Um, so this is about something else again. Um, Jack uh, tragically developed early Alzheimer's and uh, would struggle with it for years. He died uh, ultimately of complications from Alzheimer's in 2014, only a few months after my father passed away. And so this is a poem about that discovery, the discovery that this was happening to him and uh, the old, my own sense of, shall we say, guilt 
because I didn't figure it out at the time. Um, and so here's, here's the poem. Flan for Jack Agueros, 1934 to 2014. I was eight when the blackout struck and the lights died all across the city like a massacre of fireflies. In the projects of Brooklyn, I steered myself to 14F, fingers spread against the cool tiles of the hallway, past the concrete and chicken wire terrace where I once burnt ants with a magnifying glass. Many years later, at the Chinese restaurant uptown, Jack said, they got me fun here. He was my first poet. I had seen the fireflies in his sonnets blink and float away. Fulano, the philosopher in the unemployment line. Blanco, the painter painting in the madhouse. Monterosa, the dealer killed by shotgun in a bar on Avenue A. His mother, the seamstress, in the quick needle of her sewing machine. Jack, the moving man, his hands sliced raw. He stacked his apartment with dictionaries in three languages. I knew the raconteur's grin with every tale. Raul Julia is a friend of mine, a Puerto Rican playing Macbeth. He took 14 curtain calls on opening night. Maybe he would tell me now that Flan was not Puerto Rican or Mexican or Spanish, but Chinese invented by a trembling cook to satisfy the palate of an emperor in the Ming dynasty. No flan, Jack, I said, this is a Chinese restaurant. Two minutes later, he said, they got any flan? I showed him the dog-eared and finger-printed menu. No flan, I said. When the waiter unfurled his pad, Jack said to him, you have flan. He sang this song for an hour. The egg roll was not flan. The fried rice was not flan. The fortune cookie was not flan. Can we get some flan? He said, God damn it, Jack, I said. The poets crowded into the bar, striding to the mic. Jack stood with poem in hand, read the title, tilted his head, and said it again, studied the page as if the words shriveled up like ants burnt under a magnifying glass, then sat down. I witnessed the massacre of fireflies. A few of us clapped, not knowing what to do with our hands, staring at the sonneteer who lost all his quatrains and couplets in the denim jacket he left on the subway, the words of Fulano still waiting on the unemployment line. The faster you spin, the stiller you look. There's something to learn in that, but what? After the diagnosis, I handed Jack a book of poems. He dangled the book upside down like a stiff mouse by the tail, something we would sniff behind the refrigerator. I wanted sonnets. Jack kept singing the chorus of a song. Get me to the church, get me to the church, get me to the church on time. At the end, I leaned over Jack's bed to read his own poem in his ear, but some words come home after the blackout fingers crawling on the wall. I know what I should have said at the Chinese restaurant. Jack, let's get some flan. We should have braved the subway at rush hour, strap hangers rocking all the way to 14th Street and 8th Avenue to La Taza de Oro, gone now like Jack a rice and bean squid in its own ink. Café con leche y flan, Jack. A spoonful of flan for you. After all the years of sonnets and bread for me, the steam rising when your hands crack the crust at the table. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I, I was just about to call you Jack. <laughs> you honor him. A beautiful, beautiful poem. And you know, I, I, I know we have, we have come up to the hour and yet there's so much to more and it's just the beginning. And I appreciate very much your time and your reflections on your poems. Perhaps we can finish 
with you reading. Uh, I, I, just one more thing. He translated Julia de Burgos, though, which a great poet in Puerto Rico, whom I remember who died in 1953, the same year that Dylan Thomas died in New York. I remember writing a poem because they both were born in 1914 and died in 53. Yes, um, uh, yeah, Julia de Burgos and Dylan Thomas, they both died in, in the same year in the same city of, of the same causes. The same causes, yeah. Um, why don't we finish with um, a, the poem, if, if, you, if you like to read Obeyed with Concussion, which is, of course, a great poem written, written to your wife, and, and I think it'll be a, a good way to finish. And I will just end the program with you reciting this poem. And thank you very much for this conversation. Very good. Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Indran. Um, my wife... Uh, uh, Lauren Marie Schmidt um, is uh, a poet in her own right. She's a novelist. Uh, she's also a teacher. Um, and uh, for many years taught in, uh, in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, um, which is a hard scrabble, uh, a small city in Western Massachusetts. Um, the population she taught was uh, mostly Puerto Rican and Dominican. So uh, she would get up in the dark and come home in the dark. And in the winter, that can be lethal. And so that's the setting for this poem. It is a love poem. It is one of a series of love poems in the middle of the book dedicated to Lauren. And Obad, of course, is a French verse form um, and has to do with the parting of lovers at dawn. And so we will end the program with this. Obad with concussion. Epigraph. Poverty is black ice. Naomi Ajala. You leave me sleeping in the dark. You kiss me and I stir, fingers in your hair, eyes open, unseeing. You leave me asleep every morning, commuting to the school in the city at sunrise. The landlord's driveway, a muddy creek, ices over hard after the freezing rain clatters all night. Your feet fly up, your head slamming the ground an eclipse of the sun flooding your eyes. You sleep under the car. No one knows how long you sleep. You awake with a hundred ice picks stabbing your eardrums. You awake, coat and hair soaked, and somehow drive to school. You remember to turn left at the Smith and Wesson factory. The other teachers lead you by the elbow to Mercy Hospital. Will you pause when the nurse asks your name? Will you claim your pain level is a four? And they slide you into the white coffin of an MRI machine. You hold your breath. They film your brain. Concussion. The word we use for the boxer plunging face first to the canvas after the uppercut blindsided him, not the teacher commuting to school at sunrise in a Subaru cross trek. Yet you would drive, ears hammering as they hammer in the purgatory of the MRI. A week before, Isabella came to you in the classroom and said, Miss, I cannot sleep. Three days. I cannot sleep. Her boyfriend called at 2 a.m. and she did not pick up. At 3 a.m., a single shot to the head put him to sleep and he will sleep forever, his body hidden beneath a car and a parking lot on Maple Street. The cops, the television cameras, the neighbors all gathering at the yellow tape carnival of his corpse. You said to Isabella, Take this journal, write it down. You don't have to show me. You don't have to show anyone. On the cover of the journal you bought at the drugstore, 
was the word dream. Isabella sat there in your classroom, at your desk, pencil, waving in furious circles. By lunchtime, as her friends slapped each other, Isabella slept, head on the desk, face pressed against the pages of the journal. This is why I watch you sleep at 3 a.m. when the sleeping pills fail to quell the strike meeting in my brain. This is why I say to you when you kiss me in my sleep, don't go, don't go. You have to go. Thank you. Just gracias, Martin. Hasta la próxima. Until the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, and I will stop the recording now.